Good morning. As we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to contextualize a little bit the centering music that you are about to hear on the organ. It is called Erbar Medich O Herregott, and it's by Johann Sebastian Bach. It is a setting of a sacred chorale with a text from Psalm 51, which begins with the oh-so-human expression of the need for forgiveness. The text says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. With these words, let us enter into the music of our century music.
Good morning, and welcome to First Parish in Lexington. My name is Suzanne Adams. I'm one of the worship associates here, and we are a Unitarian Universalist congregation guided by a doctrine of love and guided by many diverse sources. We welcome you this morning, whether you are here in the pews or joining us online, and we hope that you'll find here questions that stretch you, people to befriend you, and liberal religious values that challenge you to join us in loving boldly, living justly, and welcoming radically. I do have several announcements this morning. Voices on the Green is now seeking storytellers for our fall show, which is on November 22nd. We're seeking stories on the theme, Better Together. Has a friendship ever changed your life? How about your participation in scouting, the military, 12-step program, a political campaign, a sports team, or a chorus? These are just a few of the possibilities for exploring this theme. We provide coaching to help craft your story. Please do contact us if you think you have even the germ of a story, and we have extended our deadline till September 27th. And uh, please, contact, please talk to me or to David Rose, or email us. Thank you. Our Preserving Our Democracy team invites you to stop by during coffee hour today to prepare letters to prospective voters. Today it will be voters in Pennsylvania. We supply everything but your handwriting and thoughts for a sentence or two and a small donation to cover postage. We will be writing letters every Sunday through late October which is not far away now. So bring your coffee, do come by. I believe it's in the common room uh, because you know this election is big. We need you. Now next week after church from noon to two is our Living Our Values Activity Fair, fondly known as the Lava Fair. Please come to learn all the work that's being done by various groups within our church and see how you might contribute. And finally, save the date October 6th, which is our blessings of the, blessing of the animals, followed by a congregational picture out in front of the church. And you may bring uh, the four-legged friends that you brought with you for the picture. Um, and then there's lunch. And then there's a semi-annual meeting. And then there's a retreat to explore our new mission and vision. So put that on your calendars. OK, thank you. That ends the announcements. Thank you, Suzanne. One of the powerful things about religious liturgy is the way in which we are invited in community to give utterance to things which might be too powerful to express on our own. We create a sacred vessel in which we can share things for which we have no words. Bread, they trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, and see how worthless I have become. Is it nothing to you? All who pass by, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire. It went deep into my bones. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint, all day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. By his hands, they were fastened together. They weigh on my neck, sapping my strength. The Lord handed me over to those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord has rejected all my warriors in the midst of me. He proclaimed a time against me to crush my young men. 
the Lord has trodden as in a wine press the virgin daughter Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my courage. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should become his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear, all you people, and behold my suffering. My young women and young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while seeking food to revive their strength. See, O oh Lord, how distressed I am. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. They heard how I was groaning with no one to comfort me. All my enemies heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on the day you have announced and let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions, for my groans are many and my heart is faint. Here ends our reading. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing our next hymn by the waters of Babylon. This morning we are giving attention to some of the most painful parts of our world. The destruction of cities, of people, of cultures, of environment. Destruction has always been a part of life from the 6th century before the Common Era until today. Violence, famine, bombardment, and war. 
These have been and will continue to be part of our collective lives. And it is part of the religious impulse to try to understand why and how these things happen. Who is at fault? Who is being harmed? Where, if anywhere, is God in all of this? And how can we express the emotions of fear, hopelessness, and humiliation which these terrible events cause within us? Perhaps we can learn to give utterance. Giving utterance means that we create the opportunity to express in words that which is beyond words. Some things are so difficult to experience that we cannot find the words to describe the truth of what is happening. We simply fall silent. I know that for me, when I see pictures like the ones that you are seeing on these screens, pictures of the rubble left over after the violence of bombs in far too many parts of our world, I cannot find the words to express my emotions. In fact, I shamefully admit I probably avoid really allowing myself to feel the depth of emotions that I could be exploring. I think we all do this. It's a way of protecting ourselves from difficult things like ongoing war across the globe and mass shootings in our own country. How can we cope with the hard things in our own lives if we also truly take the time to allow our hearts to break open every time we hear of violence and destruction. As people of faith, we are called to lift up our heads and pay attention to that which is larger than us. We must not center our own personal lives all the time. It is crucial that we recognize that we are always part of a wider world. And so it is important to set aside time to allow ourselves to truly look at these difficult things in religious community where we can care for each other in the midst of that. As people of faith, we are called to pay attention. We are the witness. As the writer of Lamentations asks us in verse 12, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow, like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. We are the people who are passing by. We are the witnesses. This is the same text which the choir will sing in a few minutes. They are singing in the Latin translation of this text, which is often read during Holy Week, approaching the festival of Easter. In the Jewish liturgical calendar, Lamentations is read on the 9th of Av, which commemorates the destruction of the temple by the Roman Emperor Titus in 70 CE. The writer of Lamentations expressed the horror of the destruction of Jerusalem in the context of their Jewish identity. Remember that the temple in Jerusalem was the very center of the Jewish faith. To center this sacred place was to enter the very house of Yahweh, the house of God. When this temple was destroyed and the people were taken captive to Babylon, there was a real fear that the faith itself would be destroyed. People returned and rebuilt, but the temple was destroyed again. And the people were scattered across the globe. Despite this calamity of the diaspora, there began, began a time of true strength for the Jewish faith. The writings collected in the Torah became central to their enduring traditions because writings can be shared no matter where you are located. The traditions and teachings and poems also became central to this faith, and they are still the crucial element which unites Jews across the globe. Christianity was born in the context of this faith, and still reveres the words of Hebrew scripture. It is important to us as Unitarian Universalists who respect all religious traditions to understand that Lamentations is read to honor the difficult things of faith and of life. These words have helped Jewish survivors of the destruction of the temple to come to terms with the calamity they experienced and that they continue to go through 
And so, in generation after generation, it continues to help survivors of every kind of tragedy to acknowledge their sorrow, to share this sorrow with others, and to ask for God's mercy in times of trouble. Lamentation consists of five poems, four of which are acrostic. The length of each poem varies, but each follows the structure of the Hebrew alphabet. There is much scholarly musing on the reason for the acrostic nature of these poems. The tightly controlled artistic nature of the poem reflects the content in that it imposes order and organization on shapeless chaos and unimaginable pain. And it implies that the suffering depicted in the poems is total. Nothing can be added to it, for suffering extends from the beginning of the alphabet to the end of the alphabet, from Aleph to Ta. Or, as we might say it, the suffering expressed contains everything from A to Z. I think the authors of Lamentation meant to convey the idea that their poem contains the total of the experience of suffering, both that which is known and that which can only be imagined. In this way, the particular becomes universal. The history of the text begins with the search for authorship. The powerful descriptions of suffering, hunger, and pain are so clear that it is likely that the poems were written by the survivors inhabiting Jerusalem rather than by the exiles living in Babylon. The intensity of some phrases are so descriptive that they read like eyewitness accounts rather than reports from afar. That they could be hyperbolic and meant only for effect rather than truthful reporting, but the poetic nature of this work relies on the truth inherent in the situation described by the desperate survivors of the destroyed city. The return throughout Lamentations to the themes of starvation lifts this work beyond mere metaphor. There is honesty to phrases like, he has made my teeth grind on gravel, that bring the reader into direct experiential contact with the survivors of destruction and help us to feel their sufferings in a tangible, corporeal way. We can feel our own teeth grinding in the dust. When we read this, we can taste the ashes. The Book of Lamentations has only two characters, the daughter of Zion and the narrator. The character who is absent is God. God is referred to, is petitioned for mercy, but does not speak. The lack of a divine voice gives more room for the human voice, and that is perhaps where the Unitarian Universalist might most connect with this text. Even for those who believe in God, there are times in our lives when we feel God's absence, not because God is truly gone, but because we have barriers within us that prevent us from feeling that divine presence. In the case of Lamentations, those conditions are extreme physical duress compiled with a sense of shame. If God is depicted as a vengeful, punitive God, how could we possibly reach out for comfort for the inflictor of divine retribution. As the daughter of Zion says to us, the reader, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. For it is in human sympathy that we can find comfort. Perhaps when that human comfort has been extended, there might even be room for the daughter to look to God for comfort as well. Our modern, modern audience will sympathize with the victim because her voice is the most descriptive. We might also connect with a narrator who is trying to make sense of the situation. As modern readers, we can have a fresh appreciation for lamentations if we unpack the self-incrimination imposed upon it by the authors and let go of their theological perspectives that God caused the destruction. Perhaps the destruction of Jerusalem was actually a political move by rulers with their own non-Hebrew theology. People are cruel to each other. We can always be in solidarity with the victims of violence, knowing that self-blame is one of the symptoms of violence. As witnesses, we must stand in a position of understanding and sympathy, 
trying to help as we are asked. But I challenge you today, however, to move beyond your identification with just the victim in this text. What if we are not the victims, but the oppressors? How would we read this text then? Are we the soldiers who came into Jerusalem to destroy the people? Has our influence or the weaponization of our foreign policy caused death and destruction on innocent people around the world? As Americans, we are part of a society which contributes to global economic oppression, taxpayers in a country that uses bombs instead of diplomacy, and continues to supply arms to a catastrophic situation in Gaza. Perhaps we need to learn to see ourselves in the role of arming the oppressor. I know that we sympathize with modern Israel as we condemn the terrorist actions of Hamas, which approaches its first anniversary on October 7th. Yet, we must be clear-eyed about the horrific effect this has had on Palestinians. An entire culture is displaced under constant attack, and they lack access to clean water, healthy food, and necessary medicine and, and vaccinations. While it may feel impossible to see ourselves in both the role of the oppressed and the oppressor, ask yourself, are we Zion in the story, or are we Babylon? I think that as people of faith, we need to find room within ourselves to self-identify with the punishers in this text at the same time that we stand with the daughter of Zion and plead for God's mercy. Do you have the capacity to do this? It's a big ask. I know that this situation is highly political, and I respect those of you who may think differently than I do. We are Unitarian Universalists, and we allow for a great diversity of opinion. But today I ask you to place yourself in the role of the oppressed who is pleading for mercy, and to consider ourselves also in the role of the oppressor who is helping to destroy a people. 131 Israeli hostages are still being held, and we grieve their captivity and all the lives lost last October. And 41,000 Palestinians have died this year. How many of those bombs were made in America? How many more people have to die before a resolution can be found? Like the characters in Lamentation, we do need to plead for mercy because we don't want to identify with the character of the enemy. As people of faith and as moral citizens of the world, we want to work for peace and justice. But we want it so much in our individual lives that sometimes we ignore the corporate sin that has led our society to be oppressive. We must plead for our own ability to change and for the courage to affect our own society in such a way that we can collectively move towards more understanding, more mercy, and more love. I hope that we can open up our understanding of the author's faith in the ultimate justice and love of God. Perhaps we can hold out hope for that absent spirit to show up and restore to us a world of balance, a world of restoration, a world of peace. The authors of Lamentation lived in a time when punishment by God was expected for those who had stepped outside of the covenant. They learned to accept it as a test of their faith, and their faith called them to wait for things to get better. Their faith called them to trust in the ultimate love and goodness of the spirit that they believe in. In chapter 3, we hear a shift from calamity to hope. In the midst of the litany of suffering, we hear, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of God never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is good to those who wait, to the soul that seeks, for God will not reject forever. Although God causes grief, compassion will come according to the abundance of steadfast love. 
In these days and these times, let us bear the hope of our ancestors. Let us believe that steadfast love never ceases. Every morning is a new opportunity to open to love, to share love, to work for more love to be in this world. Let us have great faithfulness. We believe that goodness will come to those who wait. And we know that in the midst of tragedy, compassion will come because we trust in the abundance of steadfast love. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. And now I invite our choir to come forth and, re and sing for us the Lamentations of Jeremiah by Randall Stoop. <laughs>
As we move into a place of prayer, let's take a deep breath. One more, deeper than the last, in and out. Spirit of life, gracious and loving God, bring us hope in the midst of tears. Remind us that we have each other to witness to walk with, to hope with. Maybe you have seen the collapse of this world. You have watched it reduced to rubble. Maybe you have destroyed something. Maybe you have brought harm on another or on yourself. Maybe your heart is broken open and you don't know how it will close. Maybe there are no words for your sorrow. Let us place them here. I would like to share these words from Dr. Johanna Katancho, who is an Israeli-Palestinian Christian. He writes, this is a season of mourning and weeping, but it is not void of hope. Our tears are the bridge between brutality and humanity. Our tears are the salty gates for seeing a different reality. Our tears are facing soulless nations and a parched mentality. Our tears are the dam preventing rivers of animosity. For the sake of the mourning men, cry with us to reflect your amity. For the sake of the poor children, cry with us demanding sanity. For the sake of lamenting mothers, refuse violence and stupidity. To love your enemies and to cry with them is the advice of divinity. Blessing those who curse us is the path to spirituality. Pouring tears of mercy and compassion might be piety. We can pray with our tears for the sake of spreading equity. Crying is our responsibility, but don't cry for your friends only but also for your enemy. There is more love somewhere. From Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. My Unitarian Universalism reads that as a prayer the steadfast love of the universe never ceases. Our potential for hope is infinite. Mercies never come to an end. We can birth them every morning. Spirit of life, hold this prayer and all that is left unsaid in a love that never lets us go. Amen. Blessed be. So please now rise in body or spirit and join in singing our clothing, closing hymn, which breathes music into the words of Lamentations. Let us sing of hope and comfort together. 
The hymn is Great is Your Faithfulness. Beloveds, we have journeyed together, we have wept together, we have prayed together. Let us go forth into the wider world around us, strengthened by these activities which connect us to each other so deeply. Never forget that you have within you that steadfast love that never ceases. Be that for each other. Rely on that for yourself. Be a blessing for this world as you are a blessing for me. Please be seated for our postlude, which is the Fuga in C major by Johann Pachelbel. <laughs> 